So we, first of all, I would like to welcome John Shook, who is with us today. Hi, John. It's, Hello. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to have two hours of deeper discussions with, with you and all your experience and knowledge. And on this side, it's Joachim Hilberg, Jet Frick, and me, Pia Anhede. And uh, very quickly, we have been working with Lean Transformations and CEI, Continuous Improvement Systems, for the last 30 years. So we hope that we could add in some, some uh, questions and thinking into this discussion. And I will also, also would like to ask you all to uh, come along with your thoughts, your questions, your comments, your concerns. So we really make, uh, make this as a dialogue. And to start, Joachim will start, give us a little bit of input for, for discussions. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, present some slides, what I think are some important building blocks of this. And then uh, it's to kick off the discussion and, and maybe to see if Jan agrees or if he has other views or, and, or Jack also. Uh, and and, uh, and then we also I also have some questions for you guys afterwards, but also for all the viewers, right in the chat, I'll be looking at the chat and we'll taking questions there also if you have. But I thought I'd run through a couple of slides uh, just to see what, I, you know, based on my experience, MPL since we worked together for 30 years, what we think are some important aspects. And if you want the slides, just mail us afterwards or we'll mail them out so that you can have them. Uh, I'm sharing the screen now. Yeah, so we're starting by talking about how to create some sort of system of continuous improvement. We're not talking so much about daily management and flow and, and such, but that prop, prop, uh, part. So when I think it started off with the question, someone asked, you know, what do you need? And I said, I don't know. And, and then I started thinking and me and Pia started discussing and we kind of thought out nine building blocks. So I thought I'd run through them quickly, which we think are important to create a system of continuous improvement, a sustainable, sustainable one also. And uh, so that's kind of the topic. And first one, I think the building block, I think is that it has to be seen as crucial. It's that it's a key capability of any organization. And, and I always think that the thinking that 100 brains is more than one. So we're trying to leverage, trying to use all the competence and knowledge in our company together. And, and that will really create our competitiveness. And, and it also has other benefits if you get people involved in continuous improvement. I, you grow them, they develop, and it, they become more motivated is our uh, experience. And we think it's done by working with real challenges. So it's not by doing conference training per se, but mostly working by real challenge. So that's really a key crucial thing as a first block to have this thinking or belief, you could call it. And then the second block is that we believe that an organization needs to be some sort of team-based because organizations, you know, it's a team effort. Otherwise, you can do things individual. So if you don't work in teams, it will be difficult to get this to happen. And, and it should be teams that can perform also. So not just, you know, teams on a paper, but that can perform. So you really get this cross-functional one plus one is over two. And, and the teams perform, but they also improve. Third part is... Uh, we've seen a lot of continuous improvement system. They start based on good ideas, and we think that is not sustainable. It's kind of like uh, going to the amusement park and playing with whack a mole, and you get a lot of energy, but in the end, it dies out because you're working with things that are really hindering your organization or a real challenge. So, if you don't have a good daily management our experience that it will not work because the daily management, the deviations from that is kind of the fuel for driving the CI. And then you also have the challenges. That's another part of it, more challenge driven. So deviation driven and challenge driven are key things. And 
I would like to point out, this is a model, and I mean, all models are, you know, just models, and hopefully it can make us think a bit better. So this is our way of thinking. Uh, the fourth one, you need time and resources. And um, I encounter a lot, you know, they say, organizations say, we don't have time now, there's too much to do. But, or otherwise it's like some companies now, there's a downturn in the business, so we must handle that first. So there's almost never a good timing and we don't have time to spend time on continuous improvement. And somehow you have to schedule this in. If it's scheduled in the calendar that teams or people can work it one, two hours per week, otherwise it will not happen. Uh, so that becomes important. And then we need some sort of meeting structure with the pulse. And I have two things here. And one is the hockey stick. And it kind of shows that if you don't have a pulse weekly, you will run at the end. So you will postpone things. So the pulse is keeping the focus on the ball. That's the other metaphor there. And we believe that you need probably at least a weekly follow-up. And it should be some sort of meeting structure tool drive this continuous improvement. And it's not for doing the actual improvement work, it's more to see what deviations, what have we had, what challenge do, are we having, what do we need to work with, where, where do we do quick fixes, where do we do more sophisticated problem solving, et cetera. So some sort of weekly pulse to follow up and drive it and also celebrate. Um, some sort of visual tool, and it's really to focus and support CI. And, and um, if you don't see things, if they're invisible, you cannot understand and you don't know what to do. And you see it, you can understand and act. So the visual part makes it easy to understand. You can, it stores information also. So it, it, it's like a storage facility of your continuous improvement work. Also, we found out in a good way, it becomes a standard. So a good visual support is the standard way of working on it if you do it quite logically. And it enables coaching. If you don't visualize your work, it's very hard to coach. Um, another part, I think, with visual part is that you externalize things. It's if me and Yacht has a disagreement, if you put it on up on a visual board, it becomes easier to work with the issues and problems. And also you get feedback and involvement by working in a visual system. And I'm not too worried if it's digital or analog, but I do believe it's easier to start with the analog version and learn. Then block seven, uh, you need some sort of methods and, and not for the method per se, but it's to get some sort of scientific thinking. And, and if you read the Nobel Prize when at Kahneman, our brain is geared to jump into solutions. So if you want to find the root cause and also work outside in the working place and with fact-based, we need some sort of method structure. But, and, and it also helps us have the same language and support how do we address, address things. But, on, but all, on the other hand, it's not the template also. So, I mean, it's not going to happen by just having a template and, some, and setting it out. We need some sort of method process to handle this. So you approach it scientifically and really get to preventive countermeasures. We believe that you need a coach. So yes, you have a method, but you need someone to coach you. And coaching is not about giving solutions and answers, it's about teaching, but it's also about learning for if it's the closest leader that's coaching, that person is learning. And it's also about creating focus. And then the last block, we think is important is that you need leadership here and, and that have the good habits. And first of all, that they're a role model and they do it themselves. So if you have daily management, you have it on the top, but you also have some sort of system of continuous improvement on their level. So if they have an issue, they work with it in a scientific way also, not just jump solution. And that you have a kites in mind. And, and my interpretation of that is that you focus on this. So yes, we have our daily business, but if you don't think Kaizen or continuous improvement is as important, it will be pushed away. So in the best of you know scenarios, you want to drive this every day. Some of every day, can we do some sort of improvement? And the last part is to set challenges. And, and that goes back to 
a continuous improvement system that only works on deviations would probably falter in the way because you need to have challenges to really do some stepwise direction also. Uh, so these are the nine building blocks we think are important to you know make it more top level. It should be crucial. crucial. You need a team organization. You need daily management for deviation. You have to set aside time. You need some weekly follow-up, visual support, methods for scientific thinking, coaching, and, and a present leadership. Uh, so that was, let's see, stop sharing. That was my little input as a start uh, in 11 minutes. <laughs> nice job. So, so John, what do you think? What are your view on this view on this and reflection mm -hmm. are you missing something or do you have a total different view or i i don't know uh i can share my notes as you were talking uh this yeah. is my notes i can do one page uh, difficult to read uh very difficult I, difficult even for me to read but <laughs> yeah. sharing a, a quick visual that that mm -hmm. i'm taking notes and thinking and uh i wonder if everyone else is too it's first time for me to hear your uh your your model um and as you said there are many models and as you also said i think it was the uh, statistician who uh, yeah. said uh, all models are wrong as some are useful so that i think that is not only is that the question or a truism about models uh to me that's also an underlying bit of thinking about um i suppose certainly what I would call lean thinking or you know as, as you know I have some background with uh, Toyota and often refer to this as lean uh and we can kind of call it continuous improvement but then we have to really I'm glad we have time today because you have to really talk about what these terms mean what we mean with these terms they are just words which uh, we humans make up we can interpret them in different ways so as I look at it, it so it's the first time for me to see model, your, this model. And as I understood it, you described it as a model for continuous improvement and operational excellence. I would more say it's more for the continuous improvement part. Okay. Okay. So you would make another model for the operation excellence part? I mean, I, I, I think they're connected and part of each other. But if, if, if in my worldview, I would put you, you need some sort of flow with built-in quality and okay. you need some way okay. to manage the flow and you need to improve the flow. Okay, so now I'm confused because you also, yeah. you said there were those two things. I'm not, as, as yeah. you said, all models, is, the question is, is it useful? We also said, we're not talking about flow and daily management in your first, when you described what you were gonna talk about, at least my notes, which may be uh, which may be in, in, in incorrect, but yeah. I heard you say that that you're talking about a system of continuous improvement, operational excellence. Okay, they're different, and you're not talking about flow or or uh, or daily management used as as examples, which is fine. But as just to just to help me clarify, then now you're you're saying that there does need to be. Uh, an organizing focus around flow, I think, is it? Um, yeah. And, and that's accomplished through operational excellence, and you want that to continuously improve? Would that be, would that capture what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's not exactly what you said, but uh, that's fine. That, no, that's... no, I, I try to focus more this continuous improvement part, <laughs> okay. but it's kind of like, mm -hmm. how, how do you cut up the, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing. And that's why maybe now as we get started, <clears throat> clarifying terms and what we're talking about is yeah. is important because you can go yeah. in many different directions depending on how exactly. you decide. So sometimes we use the term as kind of a, as an English term, we say slice and dice. You can yeah. slice and dice it many, many different ways and come up with different models and many models will, will help you think about it and maybe do it in, in, diff in different ways. And in the end, as you say, all models are wrong. So I think that's important. It's more maybe to help you think or approach or create some sort of mental reference. All models are wrong, some are useful. So the question is, is yeah. this useful? 
So actually, my first thought would be then, uh, having just had that preamble discussion, um, usually the, so I've been through over 40 years, many attempts to slice and dice it many, many ways, every possible way. <laughs> I've done this, you know, as you have as well, and many people yeah. who are doing it, so I'm not claiming special knowledge here, just saying I've been through this so many times, I couldn't, countless times, with companies who are trying to, to, to do this in a practical sense for themselves, and also more for folks like us, who are thinking about how we can frame it in ways that would be helpful uh, uh, to others. And usually, one of the things I realized, I've, rec I've come to kind of recognize over the years is, is that for any of these models, the individuals for whom the model makes the most sense, that they understand the underlying logic, or the people who develop it. So you had uh, nine blocks there. That's fine. So as you look at it, what weakness? Okay, there. I have again, having done this many times. Whenever we do this, we know there's some places where we've fudged something, or we've kind of uh, this part is a little loose. This part I feel really strong, confident about. This needs to be. Put. Another part is like okay. I'll make it up, for example, number five or six or six and seven or something. You could say, well, we could combine these or do them a little bit differently. As you look at it, what would you, the nine, what would be your biggest questions about, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure about this part. Or where would you find, so one of my, one of my mentors, again, I used to work for Toyota a long time ago, I promise not to talk about them too much today, unless you want to. But, but uh, one of my mentor uh, bosses, as you said, you mentioned coaching and leadership. So you separated those, right? So that's a decision. Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to separate those. Oh. I'm not saying you should or should not. I'm not saying you should or yeah. should not. But so the, the point is for each of us to think this through in a way that makes sense to us so it can therefore be useful. So my, my, uh, my, 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 one of my mentor bosses was a Mr. Cho, who later, many years later, became, so he worked with the, the famous founder of TPS, uh, Taichi Ono. And later he became the president and chairman of, of Toyota. And one of the things he said to me in one of our last meetings, which was about 10 years ago, was a purpose of TPS and that as a model, right? The house and all that. Is to help each of us expose our, our own weaknesses. As so, individuals. So but also, but also as an organization, how can we have a model that helps us expose weaknesses? So as you look at this model, where would you see the weaknesses? There's a weakness in every model. I'm, I'm going to say they're all wrong. Where, where would you see it in, in, in this nine boxes? Uh, well, it's been developing. I think sometimes it's been five boxes and then it's been 10. So uh, it's, it's yep. so. Yeah. So it's a work in process, I think, all the time. Sure. As a learning. Sure. I think, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? It's five, it's 10, it's nine. Yeah. So, so where, if you look at the nine, where would you say, hmm, not so quite so sure? I bet this part, where do you look at the nine and say, I bet this may evolve further in the next uh, six, maybe tomorrow or a couple of years from now? Or perhaps uh, I think, yeah, I think it's more. How do you connect it to the strategic challenge? It's and and the leadership part in that. So, you... so in that case, for example, perhaps it would make sense to have something a, a box that, that block that mentions something about strategic. Well, you mentioned challenge a lot. Yeah. So, and I know you talk a lot about purpose. I do. I do yes. I do yes. And I and I and I couldn't agree more that this challenge piece is very very important. It's it's critical. So how we do that and how it's a challenge at each individual level, each team level, and overall yeah. organization level. So how that's all connected, I think, is is a factor in how successfully we can create something that that sustains over time. What about uh, our our two colleagues and maybe others are asking questions. Let me see if I know how to pull up the chat. Are people going to ask questions via chat? Is that how that will happen? Yeah, one says the sound is lagging. I don't, I don't know. It works fine here. Yeah. yeah. So it could be on their end also. Yeah. 
but I have the chat here, and then and they can all speak up. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of my uh, where I, uh, where I am today is very much. You can go back to Taishi Ono. Uh, you need a vision, but then you need to go to Gemba or where it happens, start study and understand the current conditions. It starts there when you see the facts, what is going on. Uh, without any uh, special methods or so on, try to understand what's going on at the first stage and then look for the problems. Uh, and I'm not just thinking which box it is, but it's, uh, it's some of it's a bit different. Ah. But uh, uh, if you want to start, to uh, not only to start, to continue all those facts that uh, something happened. No, uh, John Shook. But uh, I think that's important. Try to understand. And uh, even if you, I've been working for, with Japanese people for 20 years, and they say the same now as they said for 20, 30 years ago. But you have to go closer. There's always problems to find. If you have some problem with technique. Or... No, I think John disappeared, but he said they might be pressing the wrong button. So you continue, please. <laughs> yeah if you see what i mean and i see the name some of you have been working with me but uh, you can have methods of course as in the block when it was block seven you said methods scientific and that is the step number two when you have been uh, start studying what is it you want to apply and the most basic method is problem solving to root cause to me that is the core of the system. Pia? Yeah, I have one thinking, and it's, um, or I have many thoughts. Yeah, I have many thoughts, but one is definitely that talking about challenges is that it's so easy to understand from one point of view or one perspective that uh, every every organization, every flow, every process have or could have a challenge. But I'm so amazed talking to people when it gets to, down to details, uh, what the challenges are. Uh, I mean, you can have a challenge like we need to improve our efficiency, for example. And you can also make, discuss the purpose of this and why, it's, why it is important. But when we get down to what Jeff is talking about, when we get down to the, to the, real flow uh, i what i can see is that many organizations have so large difficulties to express their real cha challenges in a way that it makes sense for the people uh, and that that amazes me a bit i don't know if you have talking to managers they say oh of course we have so many challenges and when you really go down and say, okay, what are they? Which one do you want the, your organization to work on? They cannot really answer that question. They cannot give a, a concrete workable challenge. No, but uh, I think that uh, depends on the knowledge or what's going on. Exactly. So, it's... so you, you, I come back to this. You have to go down in your own business, if it's operational or whatever, and try to understand see what's going on mm. before you have an opinion even mm. what's this you have to be uh, yeah look look and understand mm. so i think those two are very very hard connected to each other uh, and from from one point from the perspective of challenge managers usually cannot give you their organizations a challenge which sounds so strange mm. So I'm in contact with John, and he got disconnected, but he's connecting again. Sorry. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused about the technique here. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to see if I can get hold of him again. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts yet? <laughs> yeah, I made some notes of these uh, nine boxes, and. Uh, I make some notes uh, about you talk about quality first, and that is what something that yeah, is right. it is quality is a must. It's a prerequisite. Yeah. You must define the quality and know that you produce quality mm -hmm. if in production. 
and that is no uh, let's say compromise you can't compromise to equality you always start with quality uh, i had a i had a, a discussion last week about quality and uh, cost and the the trade offs between the two of them <laughs> sounds like a very old discussion from the it past. is it is it is but <laughs> i would the, say of course you have to define what is quality but when you know what is quality for the customer then you can never compromise with that never ever so because then you are uh, in a dangerous position uh, with with everything so, welcome back john so a question to you john uh, i'm just going back sorry everyone for the technical difficulties sometimes that happens we're not used to online that much anymore um, how would you describe or would you even describe this as system or continuous improvement uh, what, what well these are these are big questions but we have time yeah. so it's um it's it, it, it's it's okay one quick observation about the conversation you were having when I rejoined now, equality and cost, and, and you observe that that's an old discussion. Uh, one of the things I note that now that I'm older, maybe this, and I think this is part of, so we're not good at organizations, yes, as humans. Humans or whatever, you know, a million years old, a hundred thousand, you know, and we've only been working in organizations we're organizing ourselves about 10,000 years. Industrial organizations, maybe a couple hundred years. And so we're not so good at it. But it's it's one thing I'm noticing is that a lot of things that we look we learned, let's say in the 1990s, it's like they have to be relearned by another generation. The fact that we learned it and we wrote about it, it I, I've made this mistake that I think, oh, we've covered that. It's done. <laughs> but it turns out right the young you know someone who's in their 30s now is struggling with work uh, encounters those same challenges and they they're very real to them again and the fact that we wrote about it 50 years ago it, uh, they still have to go through the learning so i'm just observing that that conversation it's interesting to me to see this so that's true about this kind what is to us an obvious discussion quality and cost come on we talked about we solved that in the early 90s um but also some of these more difficult conversations too um have to be like brought up again by in, in new terms like there's uh, agile versus lean right agile grew out of people forget but agile grew out of what was called lean production at the time it was agile manufacturing at the time first and then that failed and so some software people picked up the term and revived it but i only mention that now because it's an example of another gen in that case about a half generation that had to talk about this in their own terms not the terms not the language we used in the 80s in the 80s when i got in the set i went to japan the first time 1977 and japanese management was a boom then but it was a small boom they were there <laughs> and then it became a bigger boom in the 80s and then that of course that kind of went away but the language that we would have used in the 80s was different than that in the 90s or certainly different from that in the 2000s and that so i think that's interesting as we think about the, so when we use the word sustainable we mean over time right and certainly as we look at industry and organizations overall or even in one company this actually plays out it happens so uh even a company that supposedly had had made great progress in a lot of these things when a new generation comes along uh, they have to struggle with the issues themselves, uh, as you said. They have to in, in your in your number one block. They have to be real challenges. So everyone, as you start work, you face real challenges, and then it all has to it has to make sense to you in language that you understand in the context of the real challenges that you're that you are are facing. Sorry. I, again, I thought that was an interesting conversation you were having as, as I as I rejoined, and it's something that lately I have seen a lot. That, that's all. But do you think back. companies, yeah. do you think organizations or companies or managers are good to um, to describe and uh, to develop and describe their challenges? 
Oh, do I think that's a crucial skill for leaders? Absolutely. I think that was um, probably appeared in a couple of your your building blocks. I, I think whether or not, here's the way I found that I like to phrase these things. Um, I've tried to take out of my vocabulary the words must and leaders have to. Leaders don't have to do anything. They will do what they do. What we can look at it as we as we try to analyze and understand this is if leaders have that skill and exercise that 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 practice, that's one thing. And that's advantageous. If they don't, that's a very different thing. So if they do or if they don't, there's a very different dynamic that 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 uh, that emerges is what I think in response to that. Peel. I don't, again, I don't claim to have all the all the all the. Uh, knowledge about this but that's what my experience tells me and to back to your question yes i think leaders having that skill makes a huge difference and how organizations can create something that's sustainable but in that sense they didn't just create something that sustains it the word sustainable bothers me sometimes it gives the impression of something that will self-sustain yes uh but actually introducing these new challenges uh, wherever the organization is today is is exceedingly important. So the circumstances of any company today is not what it was 10 years ago or even three years ago, or, or maybe not even yesterday. So how to reframe everything in the face of today's challenges is a, a skill that it's helpful if leaders have. How many leaders have I, that skill? I think maybe not so many. <laughs> there's a comment here from uh, Marcus. He thinks is that it's important that doing improvement is a personal journey so sustainability is the ability to help people go through that journey so i guess that resonates with what you say it's you cannot have a system and think it will be kind of it's people that is the system somehow and they need to go through that journey i think there's a lot of wisdom in that statement yes and, I, and, and not to give the impression that I don't think the system is very important. I do. And yeah. thinking of leaders as system designers yeah. uh, is, like, is, very, uh, is a big differentiator as well. Uh, you used only in, in your box number 10, you mentioned the word Kaizen. Yeah. And one thing I note is that there's a thing called system Kaizen that I think very few uh, leaders or individuals reach a point in their learning journey where they can really become very skillful at that. We can become skillful at continuous improvement at our level, which is great. I mean, that's that's what we want. But then there is a system aspect of this that builds the culture. When I think of the word yeah. system and culture, again, those are difficult words. Um, but because um, you don't build a culture, you don't design a culture exactly. It emerges. But a system, you uh, you can to some degree. I mean, I mean, just there are complex systems that get out aren't totally in our control, but we can design it. I think that's an important skill, and uh, that if leaders have it or don't have it, makes a huge difference in terms of sustainability. And defining sustainability is somehow this continuous improvement continues to happen over time. So if I listen to you, leaders, no systems do not evolved by themselves easily. You need someone that's maybe. Well, systems will evolve. They, they will yeah. emerge. They're often undesigned. I mean, they'll, they'll, then there'll be something that may be detrimental to what we want. Yeah, the, yeah. So we have another question about man challenges that which you and Pia discussed that it's important for managers to express challenges. It's a new skill. And, and they have, might have difficulties. So apart from understanding how to work with challenges, what other advice can you give to them who are struggling to, to, to express challenges and deploy them? Do you understand the question? Well, I'm not sure. What, mm -hmm. Yeah, so what advice would you have to manage? I'm a manager. I, I, I know it's important to set a challenge, but I, and I understand the how it works, but what 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 advice would you give me? You know, I'm not getting people to understand my challenges. I guess the question: What do I do? Um, one thing that occurs to me is to refer to your building block number seven. <gasps> I think methods can help, 
but then we need practice with those methods that we need experience with those methods so one thing back to the discussion again before about about cost and quality and we you know that's an old conversation which it is um now in 20 the 2020s i think we have many leaders who have had experience growing up with these methods with this thinking and and these things the, that was not the case 40 years ago when it was all new so i do think we have more leaders now who have a few decades of experience with this and who are better at this perhaps i don't know <laughs> hopefully better from having had more more experience so we can be more hopeful or we could have higher expectations today than we could in years past so if i think of leaders i worked with back in the 1990s their mindset was just radically different. And if I could get any uh, victory in the course of a day <laughs> in terms of how they might think about one thing, I would consider that a great victory. Now, I think we can have our expectations higher, but I would agree with the question that this is maybe, if it's not the most important skill, one of the most important skills. And also I would go back to my own experience now also, at, as a leader working in such a system, the setting the right challenging expectation, I think is actually very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it takes practice and it it helps it's it it it's it, and methods are needing are needed. Now, one thing I will I will I'll go back to challenging uh, on, on your on your model, which I think you wanted to ask me about. If I look at number seven, methods are needed for scientific thinking and not jump into conclusions. I would only want to say, here's what I try to train myself to do nowadays, is whenever I talk about or think about the, the technical mechanical side of a system, to always balance it with the human side. So if methods are needed for scientific thinking, methods are also needed for humanistic thinking, for respect for people. So in your model, you mentioned respect. It came up in number nine, I think, about, about leaders. Well, yes, they need to do that. But saying they need to do that is not helpful. That's also something we can have methods in place to help us. We need, it, it, it's useful to have methods that help us be the way we want to be. So if I want to be a, a leader who is good at scientific thinking and setting challenging expectations, I need to practice that. If I need to be a leader who, who is very good on the social side to show respect and engage people, then there are methods that can help with that as well. And I think they need to be in balance. You need okay. both of those equally. So to say that this, this is about, yes, whenever I would see methods are needed for scientific thinking, I would say yes, and methods are needed for uh, humanistic thinking, uh, so, social thinking as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a bit maybe about Mike's split you have the improvement and the coaching and both have some sort of structure sure sure yeah i, th I think structures and methods are are, are well struck well, that's two different things um so <laughs> methods if you look at improve yeah the improvement and, and and coaching there are methods involved with that i think there's another piece that has to do with structures and how we put structures in place in organizations to enable the kind of uh uh to encourage the culture we want to form the system that we want to be encouraging the behaviors we want to so that we can continuously improve we can continuously get better so what are those structures i think is an important uh question to 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 address along because structure I, I differentiate between methods and structures structures for example, a practical example one one real simple example of structures how many companies do you know that will tell you that we struggled make having our teams be effective, that we struggle uh, having our workers embrace standardized work. Is that and then you say, okay, uh, could you explain your organizational structure at the front lines? And they will say, oh, we used to have one supervisor for every 15 people, but now we're getting more lean. We have one for every 40 people. It sounds leaner. Uh, but no, a structure, so the reason you go to what I would say is a more exemplary lean organization, and you will have a, I'm going to use the word liberally here, a supervisor or a leader or a team leader, very close to where the operations are. 
so so actually you will have more layers sometimes yep not fewer because that is the role of all those so that is a structural question that's a decision so that's not a difficult cultural matter that it takes years to overcome or develop leaders that's a decision that any organization can make today and almost none make that decision almost none will actually decide i'm going to have a team leader for every five workers or so or something that's very close almost none do that but they'll, they'll then they'll complain oh but i can't get the workers to do standardized work do you have the support available for them to understand their work and how to improve it and the answer is no and they don't want to do that that's a decision that can be made so that should be the easier part so structures are arguably easier but they're equally important to methods yeah, yeah and i and i would totally agree both because i learned a lot from you about five plus one uh, uh, but for me it's in the team organization in that sense if you don't have a team structure it's not it will be very difficult. Who will coach you in the problem solving, et cetera? That's right, that's right, that's right. That's why in English, the word supervisor is kind of problematic. What is, the yeah. thing is, when people talk about making a, a, a flatter organization and that's somehow linear and more human, what the question is, what do the people do at every level? If they are coaches, so leaders mm -hmm. as coaches, I think that's an important thing too. You mentioned uh, uh, coaching as your number eight, which I agree, but the most, I would say the most important thing to think about coaching that I often see left out is that coaching is a skill and there's a role for outside coaches, uh, but also every leader, every manager uh, needs to have uh, coaches uh, as well. Need to, excuse me, needs to, needs to have coaching skill. Yeah. Also, how, how do, do, you, do you refer to that as a structure as well? In your terminology is that part of the structure i would say well choosing to have an outside coach or not might be a structure no I, when i say structure i, I was more thinking of having the manager as the coach i would i would call that that a set of enabling capabilities to take mm -hmm. my organization where it wants to go i think when i say structure i think of some, the mechanical design of the organization, something I can actually draw on 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 a, a paper. It's the mechanical okay. design of the organization. When I when I use the word in this context, and and I and and the methods uh, are are great and important. Without the structure, they will they will uh, they will struggle uh, to be in place. So I'll bring in some questions from the chat and try to fit them in here. And one is the five to one, and I know you believe in that mm -hmm. a lot, or you know that a lot, or whatever you would call it. And you said it's it's one of the criteria to get standard work to work, for example. And here's a question. How do you get a challenge from the company to be able to current describe it to the operators? So from first line managers down to the team operator that we need to change. How, how do you get that to happen? Um, Okay, and what was the first part of that? I'm sorry. So the challenge. So from top how do you, business. in a coherent way, describe a company's challenge for the operator and first line management to 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 set a baseline for involvement in continuous improvement? So kind of create the need why we need to change. Oh, and before that, you also mentioned the five to one thing. Um, well, that was my kind of thought on it, and that's it's one of the answers to it, the structural part of it. Okay, okay. And um, today we're doing this for fun. Yeah. And uh, we're trying, you know, we're getting ideas out there. So I hope everyone un understands that. So I, I, I don't like to go into lecture mode. Oh, here's the way I think. And therefore, you should think that I'm sharing my experience. So two things. Okay, both. So, and I love talking about this. I mean, having spent, you know, 40 or so years in it, I have obviously, I've thought about it a lot. I've see, seen a lot. And like like to mention a couple of things. So yes, five to one. Who? First of all, let me, can I talk about five to one just a little bit? Sure. You mentioned also in your number seven, uh, methods are needed for scientific thinking and not jumping to solutions. We have, always have to be so careful. If we elevate five to one, we can be jumping to a solution. 
It's a solution that has many advantages. But as soon as we put something in stone and say, here, company, this is what you must do. We're starting down a dangerous path. We are giving them solutions. Okay, this is my view. <laughs> Bear with me. The question, I, I, I think if we want to think as scientists, back to your uh, kind of part of your number seven, how do scientists think? They don't think in terms of solutions like that. They think in terms of questions. Yeah. The questions before hypothesis. No, no. Hypothesis can really be blinders. You got to be careful with hypotheses. Yeah. They start with questions. Questions must precede a hypothesis. This is this is very important. So, what is the question that leads to the solution of five to one? Hmm. Any thoughts by anyone? I'd like to make yeah, this. Yeah. 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 I'm on, on the. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think that if you have the challenge that you should produce zero defect and high productivity and have a, a problem solving skill, then you will find that a bigger team than five is very hard to coach in that way because zero defect, high productivity is really a high skill in the people and you need to train them. That's my answer. And you, you will get lost if you have a, up to eight, nine people. And you will worn out the uh, team coach then. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's right. Answer. That's <laughs> right. So what's the question that a company could use to decide whether it's five to one or four to one or eight to one? What's the question? What I want to suggest today is that's what we should bring to companies and to leaders. Is the ability to form that question, help them work through that question. So they would, in the end, decide, oh, we need five to one, we need eight to one, we need 10 to one, we need four to one, we need two to one. I, I, I don't know. And, and the question has to do with exactly what we should, I believe, what you were suggesting. So I think the question, here's a way that I think of the question. Now you could all, everyone here today can formulate it differently. But at what cadence, oh, you used the word, you didn't use the word cadence. Yeah, but pulse, cadence. Yeah. Pulse. What pulse tact <laughs> or pulse yeah. or cadence, mm -hmm. or how often and when does each person doing their work need help? And how can you provide that within the cycle of them doing their work? That will lead you to a number of something like five to one or eight to one or 20 or 21. The thing is, it is different in different types of work. This is why five to one is you have to be a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. Right. If you if OK, if Toyota set that as a standard five to one, if you go to different areas of work, it's not always five to one. Sometimes it's a, it's a higher number and sometimes it could be, you know, a very, a very low number. But the, the point is, it's informed by that question in order to 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 to, to build a quality work. And to be able to solve problems and improve it, what level of support did they need? Because the promise within within this five to one system is to each individual in the company. The company is making a promise that I'm gonna give you some work, we call standardized work, right? For you to own, this is yours, and you can change it. And the real uh, defining feature of that is not the 10 steps of standardized work, it's the output. Every minute or every hour, here's what you need to, need, here's what you need to produce in perfect quality. Never late, perfect quality. Now, here are the 10 steps that we know are the best practices today for you to do that. But now you own those. You can change those. If I ever, if, if, if someone ever asks you, why do you do step number four? Never say because it's step number four, my standardized work. No, it's because that's what I need to do to get to step number five. And that's what I need to do to, pr to produce the perfect work. So we're not just giving, so whether it's five to one or a standardized work, we're not giving people solutions that they must then uh, live with. We're giving them the methods, the tools, the processes, the skills by which they can deliver uh, results, output that they own, which is resonates with something that, that again, one of the viewers uh, mentioned just a uh, just a moment ago. And we should never think about standardized work without also thinking about its 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 flip side, which is either problem solved or continuous improvement. People say, "Oh, you can't have continuous improvement without standardized work." You also can't have standardized work without the two group. It will fall apart. The world is too dynamic. The, the, law, the, the laws of thermodynamics will come into play. 
So change, change is a part of what we do. Therefore, if you don't have continuous improvement, your standardized work will not. So it actually kind of drives me crazy. Yes, Taichi Ono said you can't have improvement without standards, but you also can't have the reverse of that. You can't have standardized work without, without, without embedding the ability to, to, to improve. At least that's what I think after, that's what I'm thinking today anyway. I'm not sure Matt's got answer to this question, but I think we made it, you know, dwell deeper in it. But one thing he asked, why, how do you communicate down to frontline operators the challenge that we need to change as a baseline? Okay. It's a great topic. I think a very difficult topic. It's a yeah. topic of high level. It's a high level of difficulty. Yeah. Um, and not many organizations at all get this well, because it's a high level of difficulty. I mean, organizations at that level, it's it's not easy. And but doing that effectively, accomplishing this effectively, I agree with the uh, questioner that uh, is is extraordinarily important. I so of course the the stock lean answer is Hoshin catch ball, right? That's the stock lean answer. We know that. That's the standard answer. That's easy. But but someone wrote it. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Great. Great. So, 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 we, so, so we get the, uh, you know, you get, you get, get the, and it's good to, to know kind of the stock lean answers to these, to these, these questions. But the thing is, it's uh, whether it's Hoshin, it's just like we were talking before that none of this is something that sustains on its own. It, it requires deeply embedded skills, deeply embedded mindset thinking, I believe. Um, and when it comes to, to this one, I would, a couple of things come to my mind. I'm just sharing what comes to my mind. First of all, I don't think Hoshin is just top down and how to share the top down. It's also bottom up. And how does, I would reverse the question. How does the top understand the challenges of the front lines so they can develop strategies that support that, strategies and tools and processes that, that support that uh, is equally important. So this communication must go both ways. And as soon as you grasp that, and as soon as you embed that in the company and the processes, that starts to change this dynamic. This challenge of getting stuff from top to bottom, it, it's a complete thing. Once we realize that getting it from bottom to top is equally important, not almost important, not also important, not secondarily important, equally important. Because if the top doesn't grasp those kind of challenges at the front lines, they'll come up with all kinds of crazy things that don't match the realities. And so therefore won't be the kind of the right level of uh, of challenge. I'll stop there. There's uh, there's much more to think about regarding yeah. this. But does that was that I would ask the questioner, was that helpful or any additional thoughts? Yeah. Uh, just, just a question to you, John. When you say sure. that you relate back to what Jack said earlier about that um manager lack no often lack knowledge and need to spend much more time on the in Gemba on the shop floor if it's if it's a shop floor to really see and understand the small problems yes 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 I, I i agree completely and a means by which that those individuals team member team leader uh, can be communicating up so that then we can create a dynamic connection between top and bottom i mean some that that may be one of the most defining features of an effective high performing continuous improvement culture how well we achieve that and that requires the structures, other methods, but also the capabilities uh, throughout to, to, to work in this way. Also a matter of intention, right? That, that, that each level of, of leadership intends to fully empathize with the people that they are responsible to support. It's like, you know, you know in, uh, in design thinking, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, em empathizing with uh, the customer. Well, in, in, in lean thinking, we empathize with the worker in the same way. You go there and you really try. You, when we go to the, the Gemba, at whatever level we are, right? We try to enter into the mind and body as we observe. You know, what, what, are, the what are these challenges so, uh, that, that's being faced by the individuals as they uh, do, do their work? So then, when I'm thinking about strategy for my department, for my team, for the company, this is embedded in my 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 awareness, so that there's so that, so that they represent the needs and capabilities of the organization. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Very much. Very I much. think it goes back to what you, yeah. yeah, it starts there to understand. Mm. And and then it's not top down. It's as you say, John, it's more, it, you're getting the inertia for change by understanding what's hindering there. And, mm. and, and that's where the challenges are. So you have, it, a, it, yeah. It does. And I think the attitude with which we go to the Gemba is, is very important. Again, we're not yeah. going there to teach. We're not, we're not going there to, uh, you know, fix. We're going there to understand. And uh, I think it's very important you go from opinion to facts, because if you see the same thing, it will create another discussion. Okay, we, we, we really realize both operators and, and coaches that we, we have a problem. Okay, we see it. What is the solution? Yes, and so I think that relates to Yoka Mutant number six, uh, visual tools. Somehow, some, so making visible and transparent the conditions. So mm. grasping the situation. So when we think of, uh, I, I, I think in terms of PDCA, Plan to Check Act, and the most important part of Plan to Check Act, which is all throughout the wheel, all of them, is grasping the conditions. Mm. And easy words to say, not easy to do. I mean, having been a ma you know manager, leader myself, it's not easy to do. And you can try, and you think you know you can have you can have the structures in place, the visual board, visual everything, and you can go to the gimbo, and you think you try to have the right mindset, but it's it's actually not easy to truly grasp the current conditions and grasp the situation. I think. Yeah, I fully agree. We we are in so I would say high pressure and we also have so many opinions that I know but often you don't know uh, that's what you realize when you go to Yamba and we all, always come into that uh, behavior so it's hard to change but uh, amazing when you do it and see it so very hard to, very hard to change and not, I'm sorry just to continue with that a little bit more something that I think a lot about lately is the power of Gemba or Genshi Gimbutsu? Can I use that term? Yes. Sure. If you explain it to everyone. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So Gemba means a real place, actual place. And usually we can just use that term. The, the yeah. more complete term is also Genshi Gimbutsu. It means real place, real thing. What is that? I mean, who cares? But it's a, it's a attitude and philosophy of empiricism or fact-based or reality-based based upon what is understanding what is the truth of the situation. And building that into mindsets and culture, this is how we make decisions, is first we understand reality. We are empiricists. So there's a long philosophical tradition of empiricism. And, and I, I think lean, or this way of working, is, um, is a, a part of that. It's, it's, it's an extension of that. It's a way to actualize that. And I, I tend to think that the world could use this right now I don't know about Europe, but I read about Europe and I visit, I haven't visited in a couple of years, but the United States, it's, it's just, it's just really conditions are tough now with challenges of truth of, of, uh, and, and, uh, what is truth? And I think the, uh, this idea of Genshi Genbutsu, Genbaism being so foundational to what this way of working is, is a powerful thing. And something that if we can get it out into the world more uh, can help the world uh, as well. You know, there's you know, now the word, there's a term in English, post-truth. Post-truth? Post-truth. What does it mean? Yeah. So, so the Oxford, the famous Oxford Dictionary in 20, yeah. they, choose, they choose a word of the year every year. In 2016, the word, the word of the year was post-truth, meaning there's no longer any truth. You know, everyone, yeah. whatever, what anyone says is the truth is the truth. Well, you know, again, emphasizing your, your, your point of emphasis, which is, no, we, we, we try to understand the facts. Now, facts are elusive in the world, in the universe, right? We have our perceptions, we have our eyes and six senses, and maybe it's not perfect, but we try to see the world dispassionately, and we try to do that as a team, as an organization, as individuals. So, so if we could, so I think that's a powerful part of uh, of a lean system that maybe we should emphasize even more than we have in the past now the night in the 2020s when truth is under attack <laughs> so um, i have a question to all of you uh, a little case so i mean things are 
hard now, as you say. Electricity prices are going up. Uh, margins are disappearing. And let's say you have this company. They've had a great time for a long time. They make a unique product that's, you know, so saves the environment and they haven't really needed to change but now they really need to change and the leadership understands it and they're committed they've had a great margin but no so no pressure for improvement now that is just disappearing and and their current situation they have long lead times a lot of stocks and not very good delivery reliability there is no daily management nothing like that and uh, they no progress control and kind of monthly meetings looking back what happened and and then um, continuous improvement they have a black belt person running some advanced projects so and and uh, where would you start i mean and uh, and would that's the question i mean you could think of flow daily management purpose continuous improvement or where but they 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 want to do something. So I would like to hear both Yacht and Jan and, and Pia. Yes, yes. I, well, I've, I've been talking too much, so please don't invite. You know. Yeah, Yacht. Okay. Yeah. You if you're in a situation, okay, okay. You know that you have to reduce cost, and you can know the and increase delivery reliability, etc. Yeah. Yes, but but then you need to be careful because traditional cost cut is dangerous you need to go to gamba mm -hmm. and study see the flow where is the stagnation where is the flow stagnated and uh, so you really focus because this is an awareness for myself last years uh, that you need to study what is creating the cost mm -hmm. and mainly one part is when the flow is stagnated you have a problem it should flow all the way but that, that's one thing on the overall picture but uh, and the workers are not they're working but not they're not they're just doing their work yeah it's also to complicate a bit more but you need the leaders should be out there the leader and, leaders yeah. yes because if your leader should be really uh what can i say reliable to the people or you should believe in what the leaders are doing they must also respect what's going on that, that they may need to understand what's going on so of course cost must always be taken down but uh, the, not the say, old fashioned way or the normal way would say the cost cut. You need to understand what is creating cost. Study the flow and then you can study the details. But study the flow first. Yeah. Start somewhere. Yeah. Pia? Uh, it's so boring, but I think I have the same answer. I mean, <laughs> really, to, to study, to understand the flow and what's hindering the flow. And uh, I mean, just uh, thinking back of the discussions I have had the last days, it's really about that and how extremely difficult it is for, I mean, I work a bit in, in the healthcare sector, how extremely difficult it is to get doctors, to get high professional people, not putting themselves into focus, but putting the flow into focus and, and get that understanding. So. I think it's where we need to start. On the other hand, I think it's in some, under some conditions, in some organizations, it's really, really hard to do it. But as, still, I think it's where we need to start. There is no other way. And, and John, do you have a different view or another perspective to this? Perspective or? Or? Again, I, 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 each, each of these I can talk all day and you don't want that, so I will not. Here's, okay, here's some additional thoughts. First, you can start anywhere, but I think there are some guidelines we can use of where to choose. Secondly, secondly every situation is going to be different. I think that's, can't overstate, everyone is different. You can start anywhere. So your first movie, I don't know, some of you even, even uh, you probably have some great chess players here online today. Maybe one of the three of you are. So I, I'm, on, I'm in trouble if I, I don't want to go too far. But in chess, your first move is basically free, right? With some limitations. Yes. 
your second move is not free. Because the Gimba reality came back at you with something. So you can start anywhere, but choose carefully. Well, I say choose carefully. Sometimes it's just, okay, let's just do something, right? But, but again, it's highly situational. It depends on certain factors. I think it's important for everyone here today or in a company to ask themselves, what are those factors that would determine where we should start? Ultimately, yes, we want flow. We want the nine things of the building blocks. We want flow. We want quality. We want cost. We want everyone engaged and, and blah, blah, blah. We want those things. But where do you start? And although you can start anywhere, starting is the hardest and most critical part, I think. If you start wrong or in a bad way, uh, you're, you're going to be just like, like in a game of chess. I could do a very stupid first move. <laughs> or I could do a smarter one. And again, the second move, you're no longer free. It's the same in a company. If we're doing, if we're exercising PDCA thinking, the first one I can analyze, I can have a hypothesis, and I can say, okay, here's my first move. After that, though, my opponent, which is reality, comes back at me with something. I must respond to that now. It's no longer free at all. And when I assess how to make that first move, here's here's something again. I'm gonna. It's it's something I referred to a little bit before. But I, I kind of a, a, agree as far as going and, 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 and I tend to think of myself in my mind. I'll share what I do in my mind, okay? I do indeed try to think of what is a good technical solution first. But I'm not saying anything about that because the technical solution is only half the, half the battle. The other half is the people. Now, a critical, as I was listening to the questioner, as you read it, a critical thing you said was they want I forget the words now. They want to change. They want to do something. They want to improve. That's critical. But many times, so my first, one of my first questions is, are they or are they, are they not? But my, and as I answer that, I have to answer a question about myself, which is, what is my role? So as a theoretical question, this thing is, it's a dangerous question. Because I can walk in and I can give them all kinds of great technical solutions every time. I, I learned to do that whatever, decades ago, I, I, I can do that okay. But it, it's not gonna necessarily matter. So I'm gonna be reading the technical situation. Okay, what do they need to do to, to create flow, better quality, lower costs, uh, all these kinds of things. You can usually see that pretty quickly, usually, actually. But at the same time, I'm actually listening, I'm asking questions and I'm listening very carefully with deep empathy to what the people are saying. So I think you missed, ah, ah, Pia, to your point, how to get doctors to move from putting flow before uh, the, the, themselves, <laughs> which is usually the case. But so sometimes I might be walking through with a doctor or a CEO who's not putting himself first. That's rare, but it happens. <laughs> In that case, I'm going to advocate one direction. Maybe it's more aggressive. But if I see that no matter what question I ask, I'm getting questions, I'm getting answers that come from the 1980s. I'm going to take a very different approach. But it's all going to be what I do is going to be informed by what my role is. This so this thing about outside coaches. We, as I started, you know, international travel as as you know, kind of a well-known, you know, figure some years ago, I found myself in the case of visiting organizations, and I know I'm never going back. So in that case, what I can, that informs what I'm going to say. If I know I'm going to go back in six months, it's very different. If I know I'm going to be going back every month, very, very different, right? If I'm going to be a regular whatever coach, then that's a completely different situation. But then I'm going to have in my mind, if I'm going to go back every month, if I'm going to, or I could be working there. I could be the vice president of a global organization, and I have power of some sort. That's also a different situation. So that's going to inform what I advocate, what I advise. But let's just say I'm an outside coach and I'm going to be going back once a month. In my mind, I'm going to, by the time I, the first visit, I'm going to have a plan in my mind of where they could go to improve flow, to improve performance, but also where they are culturally and where uh, a more advantage, an advantageous place to be uh, regarding a culture. 
So I'm going to walk in. I'm going to be asking, "What is the purpose of this place? What are the, what? Is, or is my my uh, my Japanese sensei thirty years ago? He would use the term basic concept. We would go in. So me and my 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 director. Kind of, no, 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 no. Um, so Mr. Shino would tell you that, that he's not a TPS guy, and he was actually my boss's boss. So, so the, the the in my book, managing to learn, the protagonist Sanderson was actually my direct boss, not Mr. Yoshino. But what I'm thinking about now is is when uh, a person named Mr. Oba, who was a real TPS, uh, you know, high, extraordinary, you know, sensei, and I had the great incredible experience uh, 30 years ago of going to many sites of manufacturers in the U.S. Just the two of us. Going, I'm, I'm driving, <laughs> and and you know, and uh, we go, we walk in, and I would see him do this show, right? It's almost like a little theater, and it's true. In 20 minutes, no matter how complex, but this is at that time we were just going to manufacturing organizations, so not healthcare, not 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 off the office work. And in 20 minutes, he would know exactly, know exactly everything that needed to be done technically. I mean, it, it was phenomenal. And I could not do that, which was a point of challenge for me. But how are you doing that? <laughs> Asking the trip. Finally, one, one, I, I would get, finally, after one visit, it was astounding. I saw him do it time after time. We'd walk through very quickly, go to a room. He would go to a whiteboard or a blackboard. He would draw up some things, in, in, mainly inscrutable to the people there. <laughs> say some things that they, and, and and I'm watching it every time so after a few after enough times I, I driving away in the car I said how do you do that what's the trick and and of course th that began uh, uh actually that began we he began to more seriously coach or mentor me uh, and his first coaching words were where I said what I said oh, what's the trick he said what do you mean Johnson what do you mean and, 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 and I said, uh, okay, what do you look for? What do you look for? It's similar to the question that we're talking about now. I think. What yeah. do you look for? And his question to me, what do you think he said to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to actually answer, but think about it for a moment. He said, oh, Johnson, what do you look for? He was making me quit before he just gave me an answer of what to look for. He made me question what, what in my mind, what am I looking for? Which of course I was looking for whatever, you know, I was looking for examples of standardized work. I was looking for examples. Do they have team leader, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I was looking for all these things. Right. And, and that began a process of him, you know, kind of coaching me for how to, how to understand a flow system, right? What would this thing, what would this company look like? if it were guided by developing flow. So the first question is, as we walked in, then his question always was, what is the basic concept of this place, this factory, this company? What is its purpose? What industry, what social problem is it trying to solve? You no, know, even, you know, you know, the company that makes these, you know, Steve Jobs always said, we're making products to solve some sort of problem. And that's true. Um, Every every supplier, you know, and in the auto industry or any industry, you know, uh, well, what is this? This is a device to solve the problem of people like me dropping these and breaking them. That's what that's what they're doing. And then, it, so what is the purpose of this place? What is the problem that is trying to solve it? Which is very close. If you've ever studied uh, Clay Christensen. Uh, the innovators dilemma uh, about yeah. innovation, he talked about yeah. jobs to be done. It's the exact same concept. This factory, this company, what is the job that it is doing for its customers, for its industry, for society? So you have to begin there. And it relates to this earlier question of how we do Hoshin up and down to get everyone embracing their contribution to the purpose. This, this, is, this is what we uh, want to do. And from there, and that's critical also to setting challenging expectations. We were talking about setting challenges. That's important for that as well. It's critical for that. Then the second question is, how is this place going about doing that? In other words, what is the work they do? Um, if they make these, well, they have a, some kind of molding machine. <laughs> and they put some kind of a foam, foam soft cover inside. 
So that's the work that they do. They have people that go out and buy machines and have people that put these things together, put them in a box and send them around and have machines to do it. So that's what they, so then there's the technical system. So what is, so what is the purpose of the place? What problem to solve? What is the work to be done to do that? Then do they have the capabilities to do that work? They have poor quality. They have always a bunch of spots in this injection molded thing. Why? Because no one there knows a lot about injection molding. Oh, for example, for example, right? Or they miss shipments because no one there is very good at uh, at, at, uh, at delivery and shipping and things like that, whatever it may be. It is at that point I like to think about what sort of management and leadership is required. So I don't actually begin there in my mind, however imperfect my mind may be, I don't begin with that. I begin with the purpose, what they're trying to accomplish, if they have the skills to do that, and then how are leaders fulfilling their role to develop people so they can do their job? so they can achieve the purpose. What is the, and, and back to the structures, what management system do we have in place? And by management system, I'm talking about the, you know, things like the meeting pulse that you talked about. Yeah. Something so like, like visual daily management would be things like that. that. Things yeah. like that, absolutely. All that falls in, falls in there. So I don't like to begin there because if you begin with, here's what I've learned. By learning today, I may tell you something different uh, next year, next week is that one of the big problems we've had in the continuous improvement and lean communities for decades is that people, people love to, to, to just grab any process or tool and put it in place without understanding the purpose. So I think as we as coaches then need to be really aware of that as, as we go out and, and, and coach. Um, and so only after I've kind of thought about the purpose and how the work is done, how it should be done, you could have much better flow here if you just put machines together, or you quit work in big batches, uh, and how we develop people, which is uh, you know, through doing work. And then you get to how we need to organize our management system uh, to support that. So all the things about uh, uh, visual management boards, all those things come into play. Then I think after having kind of worked through, through now it may be that with a given situation, uh, having gone through and spent a day, I may, I may say, okay, let's start with something like that. But it's only after having assessed the situation. Okay, let's put up some visual boards so we can see what the heck is going on. It's a company that has no clue how things are proceeding every day. Okay, well, let's try to make our, let's try to make the process and the results uh, visible. Same thing with 5S. A lot of, you know, there are, there is a tradition of, of CI or lean people that like to start with 5S. Um, when I suggested that to my, my mentor, I mentioned a moment ago once, he, he just, you know, he, 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 he uh, accused me of totally misunderstanding everything about TPS. He <laughs> said, no, everything is brought in for a purpose uh, to solve a specific problem. So sometimes you will do 5S first, but not, not usually. It's, and, and, and then finally, I think what we're trying to do throughout as we're putting, as we're working then, aligning purpose so that everyone understands it top to bottom. We're improving the way the work is done, getting flow, getting quality. We're building capabilities. We're, 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 then we have, we define the kind of leadership behaviors that we need, right? So top down no longer works to, to accomplish what we want to, to, to achieve. So I don't just walk in saying, oh, you, you stop being top down. No, we connect that to the purpose and how this work system is and how it needs to be. And through all that, then we're thinking about the underlying culture, the underlying mindsets, because that will be the, you know, the final failure mode so many times. And I think there's where Pia also relates to uh, the big, what, can we use the word ego of, of uh, doctors that we're often uh, spending time with? And instead of thinking of what's best for the nurses or the patient, can we think about the patient, please? um they're thinking you know about themselves and and that is i don't know is that a western european thing especially or is that just a global thing uh anywhere in the world i don't know but the i but the 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 the, the impedance that that uh leaders a large ego we can have as leaders uh is something that can't be overstated but it's also something you can't change overnight so i think that's something we're working on uh over time did that make sense Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely yes. So if, if I listen to all three of you in this context, it's, it goes together in a way. Um, but then if to 
to contradict it with something, if if I look and it's a question from P in a way, if you look at global companies that say, oh, we want to work with lean, we want to develop our managers. Uh, and what I hear from all of you here is that we need to understand the purpose, understand how what's you know, how do we develop this technical system that the leaders do themselves and how do you have a management system to control it? And it's, it's doing in, it's actually all the time working with the actual Gemba Genjing in the reality. But if I look at a lot of organizations, my question is coming soon, <laughs> is that you send it off to nine day training course on lead. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's very expensive uh, to waste the money. I and think it's... to your, to Japan also. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Like, you can maybe go to get inspired. But you you should go to your those nine days. Spend it in your own business because you have it in front of you. So why should you go away and spend a lot of money? I think that's uh, do it by home. Solve the problem at the same time you have. So. So we don't get to so go to Japan. We don't get to go to Japan. <laughs> so that was my question, John. I mean, I, I just talked to a company the other day having a nine-day training. So, and I was thinking, is that what Toyota is doing as well? Sending people off-site on trainings. Oh, well, limited. Actually, 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 maybe, maybe uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, again, I think it's highly situational. And I think in some companies, it might be the exact wrong thing to do. A company that really relies on such training too much, say, no, you're not allowed to go anywhere. You must go to the Gemba and stay there for six months or something like that. Uh, other cases, uh, in a certain point in time, there's where I think it's good to have like a strategy and a plan for this. I, I think, yes, going off, going to Japan for a week or, or, or two weeks can have a mindset. It, you. You see something different, and, and and you can you can it can be a life changing experience, yes. And that can be a that can be a powerful thing. Well, we should recognize it for what it is. You don't gain skills on most things. You know, really, I mean, per se, you you learn to look. Hopefully, you might learn to look at things differently. I think it goes back uh, it, to me. It it goes back. You know, you'll come to your uh, in number one. You mentioned there have to be real challenges in in the real work people are doing. The same thing with uh, developing people. It has to it has to re relate to the real work that I that I'm doing. So, in very traditional training terms, we 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 say training on the job or development on the job or something. Um, but so how to do that? Especially how to do that with executives is it isn't easy. Um, to, to 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 the dilemma. I think the peer raised. Okay, you're walking through again, but it's healthcare. It doesn't have to be healthcare, with a senior medical doctor or a executive, and they become successful over decades through a certain kind of behavior. They're usually by by being really smart, being being right, by making a decision and saying go this way, and all these kinds of things. So that will not change overnight, either by a two week training or even by ongoing coaching. So you might have a mix, a blend. So in the, in the uh, uh, human development, people development world, uh, nowadays there's a lot of talk of blended models uh, where you have a lot of uh, work on, at the Gemba. Uh, what, sorry, what, what do you mean, mean with that expression? So, so blended means it would be a mix of both coaching at the Gimba, but also some conceptual training, which might entail some classroom, go to Japan, read some books, uh, or maybe even per for, so for executives, oh, if it's a global company, they have money, who says they wanted to do this, this is the, this is the, uh, the scenario, Jogan, that you put in place. Yeah. I would, I, I, okay, I advocate a plan for every executive. Executives are all different. And an executive team has CFOs, has VP of operation. It has the tri uh, the C uh, chief accountant. CFOs only listen to other CFOs. CEOs only listen to other CEOs. 
the head of engineering, he's, he's not going to listen to some accountant or a guy, someone that's an HR type. He's going to listen to another engineer. So you can design programs for each executive. And we look at that and say, oh, no, it's too much work. But that comes back to the, one of the first things you said, that we don't create time. We don't know time to improve, no time to make time. If this is so important, back to your example of a global company, that said that if, they, if, they, if I think they're serious, in fact, I would even use this as a test whether they're really serious. It's easy for an executive to say, oh, we want to do this. When, you know, whatever company has great results, we want some of that too. If To see if they're serious. Okay, let's make a plan, a plan for every executive. I've actually done this with the matrix. You take the whole executive team. And what you'll find is not all of them are so important in the beginning to be part of the initiative. Maybe eventually they are, right? But you don't start with everyone. But let's, 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 let's until you've got two, well, first of all, one executive, you're in trouble. Then you want to have hopefully two or three. Now you've really got enough. You can start to build some momentum. You can start to make some progress. So what do I need to do to develop the mindset and skills and knowledge of those two or three executives? And it may be that uh, it, it may be that it's a mix of things, right? Sometimes it's discussion. I've spent, for example, an entire day, many times, with just one executive sitting in a room with a whiteboard, uh, going. So it's kind of like tutoring. Got to realize these executives aren't able to admit that they don't know something, right? So therefore, we need to create the space for them to ask questions with no one else there. And again, I would ask, it's like the standardized work question in team leaders. How often do we actually do that? We take an executive and we, we, we spend individual tutoring time with them so they can ask questions with, without the, their executive team there. <laughs> Because uh, otherwise they're exposing weakness. No, you know, these executives, they're basically not going to expose that kind of, uh, of, of weakness. So a plan for every executive. And it doesn't have to be an extensive plan. It's just that, okay, with this, with this executive, they don't need to know much. So all they need is maybe a quick introduction to what's going on in the company. Others need a lot. So, okay, I'm going to take you, just me and you are going to go visit company X. And we're going to spend two days walking around and learning and talking to that executive there. So you can hear from that executive. Because again, this is a truism, I think. CFOs will only listen to other CFOs. CEOs will only listen to other CEOs. Same is true for the entire executive team. They'll only listen to those uh, who have a similar uh, experience. Maybe that's true for all uh, old humans. <laughs> Professors want to hear think, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I totally agree. What you say, and that's um, remind you <laughs> remind me what is, uh, of course, uh, so important. Everybody is individual. You can look at Toyota and get get inspired of something, but you need to apply it where you are, and you have to see in reality where you are. And the CEOs and others are a little bit different, but. Uh, you, you can have some tools with you when you talk to them, but you need to apply it in the context you are. So, yeah, I think it's you can have a copy, you can copy, but that's not a good, a good idea. But you should be inspired. That's important. That's an yes, I agree with you. You cannot copy. I, I guess there's a to a certain extent we can copy as a way to learn. Yeah. Right. Yes. If I'm yes. learning violin, or whatever. But but if we're copying a system or a set of tools without getting to the point beyond that, without getting to the point we make it our own, it, it will it will not sustain. If, if sustaining is uh, one of the themes of the day, it will not sustain that. way. I, I think that's, to me, that's one of the biggest uh, learnings I feel like that I, that's important, uh, that I've found to be important mm -hmm. that in the continuous improvement world, the lean world, that this copycat we say copycat, you say copy, copycat syndrome. Yeah. That is, is one of the biggest failure modes that, oh, why are you doing this? Well, you know, because that's what Toyota does or something. Oh. Uh, it has to be. So there's what we do. There's why we do it. There's what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. It's just so, those three things. There's what to do, which is, okay, boards, flow. Um, or anyway, anyway I, I think the situationality, this cannot be overstated. It's highly, highly situation. So what I'm hearing is that there's no recipe for success in that sense. 
or am I? I heard more that it's no recipe for how to how to do it. So you how need to, to be yeah. extremely okay. uh, situational, context dependent. Yeah, and individual dependent. Yeah, as you said. And um, I, I met some uh, of the old uh, CEOs in in Toyota. I think it was Mr. Amesava from the uh, US and also Mr. Oh. Seiso Okamoto of Indiana. And what hit me was that Okamoto asked me, what did Amesava say? What was his opinion about TPS? Because they are all a little bit different. They do it with a purpose. They do it with a, with a horsing, but they are not uniform, even at Toyota. And that's one of the points. You don't need to be uniform, but you need to know what you're doing. doing. <laughs> Uh, I knew those two old guys as well. I learned a lot from both of them, actually. They were both uh, really cool. So I, I, back to the question, I, I would not want to go so far as to say that there's nothing we, we can do. I, I, I think, to me, that's why I do go back to questions. I think, I think um, I, I, probably everyone, all of us and everyone joined today probably as a coach in one way or another so as coaches i think we have tried to develop our coach our, our questioning skills in any, in any situation how to ask better questions so i think to structure the entire thing based the that is the entire change initiative or the entire transformation or the or the or the entire effort to create a sustainable system of continuous improvement beginning with questions is the only is the most reliable way i know to avoid the copycat syndrome if you give people any one solution, any one thing, they will grab it. If you, no matter what it is, visual board, all you need visual boards, they'll go do it. I mean, some will, I mean, some will say no, but they'll, they'll do it. Then you have visual boards everywhere and, uh, you know, they're not using them for the right purpose and things like that. So no, no matter what it is, if it's questions, which means it has to go back to the original question of, of purpose, you know, how, how, how what we're, everything we're doing is to make sure that an iPhone has a good case so that when people drop it, 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 <laughs> it doesn't break. So it needs to be a good price, it needs to fit well, it needs to actually protect it. And then everyone in the organization can say, how am I, con how do, how am I contributing to the purpose of the organization, to the problem that the organization is trying to solve? I think that's critical so that everyone can answer that question. How am I contributing to the purpose? It might be something simple. You go to an assembly line, uh, it, at, at you know where where I maybe it's more complex than this. Maybe it's instead it's this. It's got a lot of parts, and I'm putting in the little whatever it is, right? Uh, and have a sense of exactly how I'm contributing to making this and what this thing is going to do and out in the world. I think is uh, I think is important. Makes a difference to human motivation. Yeah. Any so, so from those questions, from those questions, Joachim, then they yeah. then we can then we address those with um, fundamental thinking. How do we develop people? Well, okay, we we believe. Now, now here's what I'll say too. I would not say to any individual who starts a company in the world that they have to do this. If you want a sustainable organization that that will be successful over time, uh, then I think the answers will lead you to where we're going. But if somebody back back to the question of purpose, if somebody said the reason I'm making making these these, these cases is because I want to make a lot of money quickly, so I can buy an island in the South Pacific and I can go there and retire, I I won't say that that's wrong. I would say it's not thinking. It's not create. It's not a way to create systems of continuous improvement. So if you want to do that, fine. And then we have nothing further to talk about. <laughs> I'm going to go someplace where someone wants to make a. A, a a system of of, of of ongoing improvement, but so that thinking then inform you can use that thinking to look at each one of the the, the fundamental questions. What is the thinking? So respect for people, fact based, um, setting challenges as a way to develop both the individual and the organization. Those fundamental uh, that fundamental thinking inform how we address the questions. Jokum has Jokum has has a furrowed brow, deep in thought. Yeah, I, I was 
and the question thinking question, <laughs> which um, uh, which I think is, I mean, if if I like the way you phrase it, can you phrase the transformation as questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. And, and, and at least, and of course, sometimes we're going to, you know, and, and after you've worked through some of that, you can have specific things that we've agreed that now we're yeah. going to do that. That's okay. But in the beginning, and also it's helpful for us as coaches to stay yeah. out of the mode of giving us, because we, we can unintentionally find that we've, with, with the best of intentions, <laughs> we can give some advice, do this, and you come back and they've done that. It's like, no, don't, I didn't mean do that. I meant to. I mean, think of what you need to do to solve your uh, situation. And I was even thinking more like if you think of, let's take a tool, value stream mapping, but it's all about putting questions actually. So I, I was iterating that in my brain. It's not about creating a map, it's about questioning what does it look like? Where should we go? Where are things stopping? So it's, it's a way of questioning the technical totally. system. Totally. Value stream mapping is a great example. It's a method to, to work through that. Value stream map never yeah. answered a single question. It's, no. It, all it the lean, the questions there, yeah. All the lean tools don't yeah. answer a single question. They give you the ability to ask better questions that apply yeah. to the situation. Yeah. Think of your favorite lean tool. Every single well, I think <laughs> I think uh, every one of them does that. You might find um combo. that's another topic your favorite lean tools yeah sorry <laughs> i sometimes ask people that is just say then whichever one they choose we can talk about how its value is in how you use it to address quit a comp a combine doesn't tell you how many it's inventory to hold it gives you an ability to address the question of how much you should hold yeah the question of how how you're going to move things from one area to the other that's all it does that's all it does Bastion, and if you and if i may so that you mentioned value stream mapping. So uh, Mike and I did this book, Learning to See, that introduced value stream mapping. Notice, and I think he would also say the same thing, the most valuable part of that book is inside the front cover, you open it up, there are seven, there are questions. Eight. 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 Thank you. I think, maybe, I don't know. Thank you, thank you, for, telling, thank you for telling. But those are the most important part. And what I you'll find, the book, but here's the thing, but what people do, it, nine times out of ten what people do is they jump straight to the last question they'll draw a map and the last question is okay now what process improvements do you need to make they go to that one and they go out and start you know applying the tools everywhere as opposed to working through that which helps you to a system design all those other questions are system design questions and and they don't do anything for you until you start to apply it by making process improvements. But uh, anyway, I, yes, Jokum, I think that's a good example uh, and, of how to discuss. And, yeah. and John, I, I, to build on what you just said now, there is, I mean, if I look into the organizations we, are, we often meet, um, uh, what you say now with the eight questions is that, uh, that many organizations jump into creating ideas or, or uh, answering the last question. And uh, Often we see organizations that say that they have a continuous improvement system in place and it's based on good ideas. It's based on, I mean, it's, it's the only thing they talk about is what, what, I mean, asking people on the shop floor just come up with good ideas. Uh, I think we all know here that it doesn't work and it's not sustainable in the long run. But I mean, what's your reaction to this? How to handle this because this culture has started to grow i think it's a great question and and, and I, again i just, just just my experience or thinking about that now is i would not want to say that it's always wrong to just say let's get started let's get everyone involved and let's you know and show people you can energize people you can show we care about them and they can make some improvements i won't say it's always wrong again it's situational sometimes that is okay but eventually we'll have to circle back around something more. You're not, uh, there's even something now called two second lean, right? Where, where you, where you, let's just get everyone to have ideas right, right away. That's, oh, again, that, that has benefits. But if you stay there too long, you're never going to build a system of continuous improvement that way. I don't think you're going to have to think about the structures 
you're never going to build TPS like that. I can get, I can absolutely guarantee you that. There, there, there are so many more aspects to how to that require system development beyond just uh, beyond just that. I, I think, but I wouldn't say that it's always wrong to do that. That can be a way to. Yeah, I think it, there are many cases where you might want to really, again, quickly energize your organization, and you don't want to talk to complex terms and just say, "Hey, this is everybody." Uh, has everybody knows their work the best? Let's get everyone contributing ideas and making improvements. I think that there are places where there's a place for that. I guess is, is how I, I would say that. But if we stay stay there, um, again, I, I can't tell you it's like the standardized work example. I can't tell you how many times I've been to organizations and they'll show me many many value stream maps they've done and they'll say they're not getting us anywhere. And I'll say, okay. Can you show me? It, it, let's take a look at one. And for example, what's the tact time here? What's the pulse? They have no clue. They have no clue. They, they, the, the very the very first beginnings of it. They, they one over one. Yeah. They haven't uh, started to address that. And then you say, okay, go back. And it's just doing that. It's amazing uh, how much difference it can make because that gives a team some focus. Okay, what what is the tact time here? <laughs> and then we can think about how you connect how you make flow, connect islands, uh, how you do all these different things. And then, then you're working on, you're doing continuous improvement in a way that really connects to purpose, solving problems that, that are important to the organization. Because it, it's kind of to, uh, part of the point you're making, I think, is that when we just have everyone go out and do improvement on their level without direction, eventually it's not going to be contributing to really help create flow, help the customer reduce cost and, and solve the problems of the organization. And, and it, if that occurs, then it will stall. It will not sustain, I think, is something we can say. So, so that makes me wonder, like, if so, are there questions for a system? You said the, those are system design questions to the value stream map. So are yes. there questions for a system design for continuous improvement? And if so, what could they be? Great, great. I think that I think that'd be a useful uh, exercise because you're right. Those questions are built toward designing a material and information flow system, right? Exactly. Yeah. Two, two dimensional. That's all they're for. So vast yeah. map doesn't go beyond that. But there is yeah. more. There are many more dis dimensions to the system than that. So what are the questions that would inform? So maybe next time we can talk about your 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 proposal for what those questions would be. <laughs> <laughs> So that was why I was having the little burrow there. I was thinking of those questions going back from the value stream map eight ones, which I think are great. And I tried to start okay. with number one. Yeah. And, and, and I really, uh, you know, it's system design. So, so what are the system design questions for a CI system? Yeah, that's interesting. I think, it, I, think, yeah. I think there, I think that's a very, a very, a very good question. I remember even when you say scientific thinking, I mean, the scientific revolution, which happened closer to you than closer to me, uh, was, was not about the discoveries. It was about discovering, we finally admitting as humans that we don't know everything. Exactly. Yeah. But we have methods by which we can learn things. So that's what this is exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yes. What would be the, 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 the questions to drive, uh, to, to design? And, and again, Joe, it needs to be situational that any company could yeah. use. I just copy. Yeah. I think the first one has to be, as someone mentioned it in the uh, chat, it has to be back to purpose, right? Purpose yeah. and customer yeah. and value. And I think that's got to be, it's got to start there. I mean, uh, yeah. from there, where does it go? <laughs> and then you talked about structure quite much. I think. Yes, I, th I think if we don't build the structures, it's very hard to make, to sustain to that question. Mm -hmm. okay. I have to take notes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no. doing the technical side, taking notes and chat, so. <laughs> cool. Um, no, uh, I, I would love your, your proposal for the questions too, darling. Yeah, that would be it. We could, it could be a mutual, a joint. It could be a joint yeah. design exercise with the people in the chat and everything. You know, you could yeah. throw, you could, uh, you could, you know, make some, some, some suggestions and we could work through it. Yeah. 
Any other reflection or thoughts about continuous improvement? I mean, it's a huge topic. And, uh, and I mean, I'm young, I'm just 55. You guys have yeah, a bit uh, more experience. <laughs> I liked your discussion in the beginning about uh, leader leadership skills. If they don't do or don't have the skills and uh, that you really need to think, think through that part carefully and that is a part of this as well yeah, I, th I think so i think so i think so and, and if they if if i'm with a leader the first time or a leadership team if they seem to really be energized and knowledgeable and so it's great when you find a team right that's knowledgeable and wants to go in what we think is a desirable direction is great. Then it's like you don't have to play games. You can just okay here, here. And other times it's very different. In that case, you know, you can't pretend that they're going to change overnight. So what do we do in that case? Now, some people would say, in those cases, just walk away. You can't help them. I don't know. I'm not satisfied with that thought. Um, if there's someone, if there's someone there, wherever they are in the organization. Who, who wants to improve then, then I want to help. I mean, it might just be, it just it might just be the, the a nurse <laughs> in the ER and not the CEO of the health system. And yes, she's gonna face, he or he will face tremendous challenges, but still, you know, I mean, that, that, to me, the great, one of the great things about the system is, yes, you can use it to transform an entire organization, but also any individual, can use the thinking and the, and the tools and skills to improve their situation, no matter what their level of job is. I, I, th I think sometimes when we ask, okay, how many organizations have fully embraced this and become sustainable? I don't know. And, and, and I sometimes think the question is, it's interesting, but I think maybe a more useful question is how many people come to embrace this as a way to inform their thinking and the way they work. And then I might be a department head in a, engineering department, or I might be the, uh, wherever I work in healthcare, and I can influence and I can work better myself. My day to day in life can be, can, can be, can be better. Now, if it's a CEO, they have greater influence, of course. Um, but it's, to me, it's not just all about the CEO to me, to me. No, and I think that's a great attitude to have or approach to have towards this as we often get the question, uh, I mean, how do I convince my manager? Uh, which I think, um, I mean, it's a totally wrong question. Start with working with, with, as you say, what you have and where you can influence. What can you do? What can you, how can you learn? And how could I help you learn? And as part of that, does that mean how you work with your boss? Sure, that's part of it. Especially if the boss is actually in the way. But so often they're not really in so often they're not really in the way. They're just not doing what we think they should do, whatever that is. That's, that's another part of this that I've often found is people raise that question. And they say the question in a way that's more than just a question. It's, it's like a, I'm stuck. I can't do anything because my boss thinks differently. But would you say that creating a CI system uh in this way is easier because you are you can more work independently? than changing the technical system. I mean, I, I think so. And again, of course, you have disadvantages in that case, but, but there's still always much that you can do. Um, and, and let's work there. And then, you know, people will see, hopefully, including bosses, and you'll find allies. Invariably, you'll find allies somewhere in the team next door, or you know, in, inside your team, and then your boss starts to see that. It may or may not happen. I think it often does. But anyway, there's no point. I've seen too many people. So I did teaching university for a while. And then I've seen you know, them leave and go and have careers. And I've seen too many people spend huge amounts of their careers wishing their boss was different, wishing they had a boss who did things differently. And it's it's waste. That's another kind of mood, I suppose. Just 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 wishing your boss was different, wishing your CEO was different. Uh, it's not going to help your situation. It can be useful to think about. I wish they were this way and that way. But I've seen people wasting almost the entire career, always wishing they had a different boss. <laughs>
<laughs> and, and 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 one more thing. One more thing. One yeah. more thing. Every, everyone has a boss, yes. including CEO, including CEOs. CEOs also. So that okay. I know we're running out of time, but but that's one mm -hmm. thing. One thing, Joachim, you said you're younger than some of us, but I can <laughs> I can remember when I was very young. And as you rise up, you get older, mm -hmm. you work with different levels of people in companies. And so eventually I, I'd work, you know, I'd work with, you know, you know, more or less with, uh, let's say, production managers, sometimes also team leaders and workers, then you then it's the, the shop manager, then the VP operations, and, and, and uh, then the uh, COO and the CEO. And at every level, everybody says, I could do this, John. If my if I was if I was the 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 VP of operations, talk to the VP of operations. Oh, I could do this, John. If I was a COO, talk to the CEO. I could do this if I was a CEO, but I don't have. And, I, and that's just totally not productive thinking. It may kind of be true to some degree, but no, you can do what you do at your level. And by the way, you get to, to be the CEO, and you still got a boss. You got a the CEOs have less free. We think CEOs have all this power. If it's a public, co you know, owned company, yeah. they're totally at the control of their boards. They're only going to be there three or five years. Uh, I'm not convinced the CEO is always so critical place to start. I mean, sometimes, yes. If that's the person who calls, yes. If, if whoever calls me up, I don't care what their role in the organization is. If they want to really learn, this is the learning system. And if they want to learn and do this, I'm perfectly happy with a frontline nurse versus a CEO. That's me. That's me. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic uh, thing you say now, and and maybe it should be the last yeah. word of of uh, this session. And I think it would be great if we could come back and have a discussion about the questions yes. to design a CI system. Oh. And one of the themes today was challenge. So we have a challenge this is, uh, to develop exactly. questions. Thank you. This was, this was fun. Okay. Thanks. And um, thanks, everyone, for uh, your questions. Uh, I think when we were in one training in, uh, in Gifun, uh, Toyota factory there, they said, what did they say? If you don't ask, if you ask questions, you can be ashamed for the moment, but if you don't ask them at all, you can be ashamed for whole your whole life. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit hard. <laughs> you know, good. Right. And yeah. therefore, we keep the chat open for ten more minutes. Uh, if you want to have a comment, if you want to to uh, write a question, uh, please add that to the chat, and and we'll bring this with us. Also, if you have any input for other discussions, uh, I'm I'm. I'm thinking of the questions. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, great to see you again, John. Hope to see you in Europe or in the US. Yes, yeah. yes, conditions have changed. We can travel now a little bit. Yeah. So very good to see you. Very good to join this. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much, John, for your time and your your uh, sharing your experience and <laughs> this job. I never give up. Never give up. <laughs> Never give up. Never give up. That's, that's, that's important in the question. That's right. Yeah. Okay. But take care, everyone. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.